Man, I really pray you're doing good. This morning, I'm excited about today's message. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, we'll be in verses 7 through 10. Now, as I was praying on Monday about the direction that the Lord wanted to take us this morning here in this set of verses, I felt the Lord speak very strongly uh, about something that the Lord is bringing us on. It's a journey into friendship with him, that we're no longer just being obedient out of um, need or out of, because uh, we have to, but progressing to a stage with the Lord to where we understand we have the heart of God and we get to be obedient. We get to be holy as he is holy. How many of you know that, man, when we really walk and we're on this journey, that uh, it can be a joy to walk holy and rightly before the Lord? It doesn't have to be this difficult uh, thing. And I believe this is what the Lord really has for us in this next season here at Journey. As we're looking at uh, this chapter and these set of verses, I believe James lays this out for us. So let's read James chapter 4. If you're ready for God's word this morning, say let's go. I love it. This is... It. Man, if we get this down, y'all, <laughs> if we can get this down, it will change your life forever. Yeah. This, this is such a simple truth this morning. It's such a simple truth, and we all know it. <laughs> We've all heard this before, but man, I'm telling you, if we walk this thing out, if we walk this out, <laughs> let's just read and we'll get into it. <laughs> Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10 here. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will what? He will lift you up. I've entitled my message here this morning, Kingdom Promotions. Kingdom Promotion, if you like my notes, you can text notes to the number on the screen, and what's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Holy Spirit, we come before you today. God, we come before you this morning. Lord, you're better than anything we could ever imagine or think. Lord, I pray that, God, that, Lord, would we recognize your goodness. Lord, I believe this morning, Jesus, as we look at your word, that, God, that it can has potential to change our hearts and move us into a deeper relationship with you, a deeper friendship with you, God, for, Lord, we're all on a journey, and, Lord, we don't want to stay God, where we currently are, but Lord, this journey is calling us into a deeper level, a deeper understanding, a deeper knowledge of, Lord, your mission and why we are here and this relationship that you want to develop with us, God. And so, Lord, I beg of you this morning, God, that you would instill inside of every single one of us your heart, oh God. Lord, we want your heart. Lord, we wouldn't continue just to walk, God, with our own selfish ambition and desires, but you would instill inside of your people, God, this morning, your heart. Lord, I'm guilty, God, of so often trying to get what I want and what I desire. Lord, we're all in this room and we're all guilty of the same exact thing. Lord, we don't want to make ourselves gods of our own lives, but you and you alone, would you teach us, God, to walk submissively before you and go on this journey with you into a deeper level of friendship, Jesus. Lord, we trust your ways. 
In everything, God, we trust your ways. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You know, I'm, I'm really thankful in my life that I, God hasn't given me what I've always wanted. <laughs> you know, I, I probably wouldn't be here today standing before you if God gave me what I wanted. I probably wouldn't even be married to my wonderful, amazing wife if God gave me what I wanted. Not because I wouldn't want that, because I probably wouldn't even met her. When I was a teenager, I wanted to own my own juice company and move to Colorado because I thought that Colorado was the best place to move to because the mountains, everything else, because the documentary I watched. And that was the desire of my heart. But I would have never met my dream girl if it wasn't for that. If God gave me everything I always wanted, I would have never been here at this moment in this time. If God gave you everything you wanted, you probably wouldn't be here right now either. And I have to tell you this morning this, I believe that there's no mistake that you are here today. I'm thankful that God has not always given us what we have wanted and what we've desired and what we have chased after in our selfish ambition. But what I know is this, is that as we go on this journey with the Lord, it can come to a point to where God does give us the desires of our heart. It's Psalm 37 that God will give you the desires of your heart, but it's not because of this selfish ambition and your own selfish desires, but it's leading us to a place and to a point to where God begins to give us his heart. And as God gives us his heart, then his heart becomes our heart, and then look, he gives us the desires of our heart. Do you see the progression? I, I, when I look at James chapter 4 here, I believe that these five things are progression moving from a slave mentality into being a friend of God. That we're beyond, moving beyond just doing out of obedience sake into a place of friendship with the Lord where we are partnering with him in the mission that God has for us on this planet. James walks us through this. Slaves and servants of God is not a negative term, though, in the kingdom of God. Because we got to start somewhere, right? It's not a negative term in the kingdom of God. Uh, Paul and other New Testament writers, they start off many of their letters by saying, Paul, a, a servant of God, a, a bond servant. This is what... Um, a servant is, it is obedience out of duty or command. It's obedience out of duty or command. So as we grow in our walk with God, our obedience out of duty leads to something much deeper though. What does it lead to? It leads to friendship. This is what Jesus uh, says to his disciples in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you what? Come on, say it a little louder. I've called you what? Friends. Friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Friendship with this perfect father, God the Father, implies a deeper level of trust, intimacy, and shared purpose. What happens is we journey with the Lord and we're coming from uh, servants and obedience out of just, I've got to do it because God asked me to do it, is I've got to do it because I want to do it, because I love the Lord and I have his heart, I understand his, his mission. And this is the progression that we all have to go on in our walk with the Lord to go from being servants to being friends and this friends with a perfect father. And for some of you in this room, you think, okay, I'm a, I'm a friend of a perfect father, the, the father, the God, the father, I'm, I'm, I'm a friend with him. And it's really difficult for us to understand this friendship with the father because many of us, we have a broken relationship with our earthly father. And what I'm praying for you this morning, if that is you in this place, is that God 
would heal your heart from this brokenness that you've experienced with your relationship with your earthly father. And that he would reveal his heart for you and his love for you and you'd be able to understand it and have this new fresh revelation of this love that God truly has for you as a perfect father who would chase after you, who would do anything for you, who is, who is for you and not against you. Like this, this father is absolutely perfect. You cannot compare this perfect father with your earthly father. And I love this because when you think about even this progression in our relationships with, in our lives, right? I think that Friendship is really a, a difficult thing to understand in today's society because friendship is not about the friends that you have on Facebook, right? It's not. It's not about the other followers you have and all of that. In this, in this culture that we live in today, when you say friends, it means something different than what, what friendship really is. What is friendship? Friendship is someone and that you can trust, that you uh, go to for uh, comfort, and you go to to share many, many things that you kind of wouldn't share with other people. And it's not about friends as in Facebook friends, but what God is drawing you into is this friendship with a perfect father. And he has an inheritance for his kids that he wants to give. And so how many of you want the heart of God? I want the heart of God. And it comes through this journey with the Lord that I believe James lays out here where we go from submitting to God, resisting the devil, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you, right? Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. And so the first thing that I want to give you this morning in this progression that we see here in James, which leads to friendship and kingdom purpose and kingdom promotion is this. Number one, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That we would what? Submit ourselves, therefore, to God. How many of you know that submission in, in culture today, it can be a little bit challenging because we're encouraged all the time. Hey, forge your own path. Be your own boss. Do your own thing. And while here naturally, uh, in a natural sense, it's not a, not a bad thing that we're encouraged to do that. But in a spiritual sense, the repercussions of having this mindset can be immense. Because friend, uh, true freedom, freedom in a natural sense is through uh, not having a boss and, and all these other things, but freedom in a spiritual sense is what? Submitting to God. We can only try find true freedom when we fully and completely submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is how we find freedom. It's something about when we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel, when we lose our lives for the kingdom of God that we begin to find our lives, we find our purpose uh, it, freedom comes when we submitted to the lordship of God. This uh, Greek word for, for submit here, it means this. It means to place oneself under someone else's authority. It's a military term often used to describe soldiers submitting to the orders of their commanding officer. In the context of our spiritual lives, it means recognizing that God is sovereign, that he knows better than we do, and that his plan for our lives is good, even when we do not understand it. It's when we come to a place where we wake up every single day and say, God, not my will today, but yours be done. Lord, I trust you. I may not fully understand everything at every single moment, but Lord, I know your ways are higher, your thoughts are greater, and so Lord, I want your will today. What I love is that, you know, Jesus, he modeled this for us. The Bible says he did nothing outside of the Father's will. If Jesus, the Son of God, did nothing outside of the Father's will, then how much more should we submit to the Father's will in our own lives, right? Jesus did nothing outside of the Father's will. At the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? Not my will, but Lord, yours be done. Jesus modeled this for us. So how do we practically walk this out where we submit to God? I think the most challenging thing in 
our lives is giving up control. Giving up control. Many of you in this room are tired, are worn out, because you haven't given up control to the Lord and your trust in him. You've got to fully give up control to God. I often in my life, I've held on control way too long and way too hard. And I've tried to forge my own path and do my own thing. And what's only left me in a place of burnout, in a place of, man, I am just tired, God, because I tried to make it happen on my own rather than trusting in the Lord. We've got to come to a place where we can trust the Lord and give up control in every single area of our lives. We can't just say, okay, God, you can have, uh, I submit this area of my life to you, but I'm still going to hold on to this area of my life. And we like to compartmentalize God when true worship is when we give everything to the Lord. When we fully submit every area, every box, because our lives can't be in this little, little box. We like to separate everything, that our work life would be fully submitted to God, that our Finances would be fully submitted to God, that our lives and the direction of our lives would be fully and completely surrendered and submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. This is when we find freedom in the kingdom of God. In Proverbs 3, it says, trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make what? Your path straight. We've got to come to a place where we completely and fully trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, everything, God, everything, I'm trusting you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding because his ways, his thoughts, everything is so much greater than ours. He knows everything. He sees everything. That we acknowledge him, that we worship him in every area of our lives, and he will make our path straight. I love this because it mirrors um, in the New Testament where it says that he directs the steps of the righteous man. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. When we fully submit to him, he's ordering our steps. He's ordering our steps. We may not see it. Why did this happen, God? I don't understand why I'm here at this particular moment, why I'm going through this. But then I assure you on the other side of it, we're submitted to God we'll see that the, 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 the difficulty that we might be going through or why this might have happened, we'll see on the other side, man, God, I'm glad that I went through that. I'm glad because, no, Lord, I now know that you used that to bring me to this point. <laughs> and submission to the Lord is everything. Apart from him, we can do nothing. You fully and completely submit to God, the second thing that James writes and says is to resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You've got to know that, man, we are in a spiritual battle in a spiritual war right now, yeah? Yes. You have to be blind spiritually not to see this and not to know this. What is happening in the world today is... No doubt about it, it can look at it on the surface and be incredibly discouraging. But what I know is this, is that as the darkness gets darker, the light gets lighter. And what I see is that God is setting up a time where he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. His sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will dream dreams. Old men will see visions. He is pouring out his spirit. And we are trusted in these last days to carry something, the presence of God within us. And as we are carrying the presence of God within us, he has given us the strength to what? To resist the devil. And what has to happen when we resist the devil? He has to flee. He has to flee. We are in a battle. We are in a spiritual war. We have to know it. We have to see it. We've got to be so in tune with the spirit of God at all times. We've got to know and rightly discern what just happened in, in culture today. I mean, you look around at what's happening in Israel and the battle, what's happening politically here and how there's such division. There's wars, rumors of wars. There's, 
natural disasters when you turn left and right. Do not get discouraged because there is a battle. It's a battle for your life, a battle for your soul. But here's the thing about this is that, man, as we pray, as we humble ourselves, as we seek the face of God, as we submit to him, man, there is victory in Jesus. We don't fight. We don't fight for victory. I know what the end of the book says, and we win. We win because God has already won. What do we have to do, man? We got to put on the armor of God every single day, don't we? Put on the, the feet of peace. I mean, when you look at the news today and what's happening going on, man, how can you have peace without the Spirit of God being with you? You'd have the feet of peace and the, the belt of truth so you can rightly discern what is truth and what is not because you will be deceived if you don't have the awareness to be able to discern what is truth and not by the Holy Spirit that lives with inside of you. You put on the belt and the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and you would be holy as he is holy. Put on the helmet of salvation. You know, the Lord has led me to pray, Psalm 91, over this church that he who dwells in the secret place, the most high God will rest underneath the shadow of the Almighty. He is our salvation. He is our ever-present help in time of need. He has given us the shield of faith. I mean, we can have faith and trust in the Lord. We can know that, man, God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? I mean, we can have faith that God can move mountains. Man, we can have faith that God can heal, set free, and deliver. We can have faith and faith in God because he is a good God. And he has given us the sword. He's given us a sword. What is his sword? It's his word. It's his word. How can we defeat the enemies with this word? It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And we, as believers, we got to hide this word in our hearts. We meditate on it because, man, when the enemy attacks, you've got to know the word. The enemy will come, will come to try to tempt you, to try to deceive you, and you've got to know the word. Amen? You've got to study it. Because, man, when the enemy comes to attack and begins to tell you lies and begins to whisper things in your ear that are not true, the lie of you are not good enough, I want you to hear the word of the Lord when the, when the lie comes. Psalms 139, 14, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. God made you. He made you. For you are fearfully and wonderfully made. David writes, my soul knows it very well. Or the lie that God does not really love you. Hear the word of the Lord when you hear that whisper. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God or the lie that the enemy will try to whisper that you can handle life on your own, that you don't need him. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. In John 15, 5, I am the vine. You're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do what? Apart from God, we can do nothing. We have to be so reliant on the Lord. Don't believe the lie out of pride that you can do it on your own. You need God and you need his help. Or the lie that the enemy will try to whisper to you that your past defines you. Your past does not define you. Listen to what the word of the Lord says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is what? He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Your past does not define you, what you have done, what you have walked through. The sins you've committed, it does not define who you are. You are a new creation in Christ 
Jesus or the lie that the enemy will try to convince you, try to make you believe that you can find fulfillment outside of God. Nothing in this world can truly satisfy you. We can try to find fulfillment in so many different areas and so many different places. But hear the word of the Lord this morning. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Or the lie that you're alone. You're not alone. God's with you and if God's with you, who can be against you? He will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We can resist every lie of the enemy with this word. But you gotta read it, you've gotta know it, you gotta stand on it. Man, when you're going through a difficult situation, find a word. Go to, the, go to the word of God and stand on it, man. Write that word down on your dashboard. Remind yourself of it. Remind yourself of what the Lord says about you when he says as you're going through that battle and that storm and stand on it. Stand on it because the enemy will try to come in and discourage you. Let me say this real quick because I felt like the Lord uh, dropped this in my heart uh, in worship this morning is that as we were in this spiritual battle, that oftentimes you can get to a place to where you were battle weary. I believe many of you in this room right now, you're in a place where you were battle weary. You're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting, and you have faith and you're standing strong in the Lord. And to a level degree, you're like, God, I'm giving you control. Lord, I'm submitting to you, but you still feel tired and worn out. Listen, when you're feeling tired and worn out, the only thing to do is to go before the Lord and worship. What happens is his presence comes in. His presence comes, and when in his presence there is fullness of what? There's fullness of joy. And from the joy, from that place of joy that he fills you with and peace that he fills you with, then you can find this exhilarating walk with the Lord. That God would reignite the passion within you. Don't allow this battle to cause you to be battle weary. Don't try to do this on your own. Many of you in this room, you're battle weary. My encouragement to you is, man, you've got to spend time with the Lord. Which leads me to the, to the next point this morning. Number three, drawing near to God. Drawing near to God. This is the most beautiful promise in all the scripture. This is the most beautiful invitation, I believe, in all the scripture, that if you draw near to God, God, like the creator of the universe, the king over everything, who is sovereign over it all, he will come and he will draw near to you. This is a promise. Some of you in this room, you've never had this encounter with God that has marked you. You know, when I was uh, 16 years old, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that marked me forever. You know, I gave my life to the Lord as a, as a young person, but then when I was 16, I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit in the middle of worship where I was like, okay, God, I, I've heard all the things, I know all the things at this point, but... At that particular moment, I needed an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came, and I encountered him, and it changed my life forever, and I was marked by him. It's an incredible promise of God that as we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And this is really the, the process of what God has been trying to restore since the garden is relationship with us, Right? Adam, what did he do? He walked in the garden in the cool of the noonday. He had that type of friendship, that type of fellowship with God. God gave Israel the Ark of the Covenant, which represents his presence. Jesus came, and he died on the cross, and he uh, gave us the ability to now uh, create a way so that we can have relationship now with God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. 
And so we live in a place now underneath the new covenant that we can have this relationship with the Lord and this promise is for everyone. If we draw near to God, he will what? He'll draw near to us. We did a whole series on this called The Intimate Pursuit back about a couple months ago, about three months ago. If you, if you missed that, I encourage you to go look at that. And, there's, uh, and I encourage you to have your time with the Lord every single day. Make time for him. Make time with him in the morning and draw near to him. I'm not always perfect with it, man, but when I do, there's something about my day that's set up and just different. Number four this morning, and this progression from friendship that leads to kingdom promotion is to cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Let's read this, James 4, 7 through 8. Just a recap, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. We're all sinners in need of a savior, are we not? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and I'm thankful though that we can come before the Lord and he washes away all of our sin, all of our shame. You know, in the, in the biblical language, our hands, it represents our actions and behaviors. Repentance is not just a one-time event that happens when we first come to Christ. It's an ongoing process of turning away from sin. To cleanse our hands means to examine our actions and ask, God, are there things in my life that are not of you? God, are there things in my life that are not pleasing of you? Would you show me? And as we draw near to God, what he does is he shows us those things and then we then can release the sin in our life because what happens is we cannot draw near to God if we're holding on to our sin. We've got to turn from our sin, turn from our ways, and turn towards God because sin separates us from God's presence, not because he doesn't love us, but because this sin in which we're holding on to distorts our hearts towards God. I think about the garden, right? Adam hid from God. But what happened? God came in looking for him. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? He's still chasing after him. But yet, sin separated Adam from God. So how do we cleanse our hands? First thing is we've got to be honest with ourselves. Honest with yourself. Honest with, hey man, is there areas in my life where i uh, Walking in sin. And walking in sin may not even be something that is, uh, is a sinful thing as far as, man, I've, uh, I'm doing something that is uh, known, that is in the word of God, that I should not be doing. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about are you walking obedient with the Lord in just the details of God, Right? And so you've got to be honest with yourself. What, what ways have I fallen short and confessed those sins? Because God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the second thing is to change our behavior. You've got to change your behavior. This is what Jesus said. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent meaning to change the way you think, to change your thought process. We can't just confess our sins and then continue to sin. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change our actions, change um, the way we are living in our lives. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so God has given us our mission for the kingdom. We can no longer live in sin and do what we want to do. We've got to change the way we think, walk with the Lord, and then see his mission being accomplished through the kingdom of God in and through us because now he can trust us with it. The last thing here, which leads to this fifth progression James gives us to lead to friendship and kingdom promotion, which is purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. So you can see this. You submit to God, resist the devil, and draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And what happens is God comes and he purifies our hearts. The heart in biblical terms represents the core of our being. 
our thoughts, motives, desires, and affections. While cleansing our hands speaks to outward actions and behaviors, purifying our hearts speaks to the inward transformation. Our inward transformation. Purifying our hearts is not something we can do on our own, but is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. How I kind of look at us is, you know, we are all onions being peeled back and God is constantly working on us and purifying us. And this is a journey that God will constantly be doing in our lives where he will take things that are not of him in this pursuit after him, pursuit of friendship, and he will work on the things in our lives that are holding us back. Maybe it's a forgiveness issue. Maybe we haven't forgiven someone. Maybe it's a deep level of hurt where somebody has sinned against us and God wants to purify our hearts. You know, I would much rather God purify my heart through the work of the Holy Spirit than bring a circumstance in my life that is painful in order for me to wake up and then I can recognize and humble myself before God and then he purifies my heart. Because we're gonna, God's gonna purify our hearts one of two ways. Either through the work of the Holy Spirit in which we allow him to do or we can resist the work of the Holy Spirit and he brings circumstances and situations in our life. This is what James chapter one was really talking about. Count it all joy when you go through trials. Through the testing of your faith. Brings perseverance. And in this perseverance, it brings holiness. And God is purifying our heart through trials, through situations in our lives. We can learn a lesson one of two ways through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We can submit to him or through difficult trials and circumstance situations because in this life, we're gonna have trials, right? He does use those things. We can count it all joy because knowing that God is doing a work inside of us of purification. I want God to purify our hearts, to give us his hearts, that we would have the right motive in our life. Because friendship is not about rewards that we can get from God. It's not about what he can do for us. But it's about partnering with him in this mission as we begin to have his heart and he puts inside of us his heart for what he wants us to do and we get to be obedient we get to be holy and so in verse 10 here we see this lifting up humble yourself before the Lord and what will happen he will lift you up these five steps lead to a humble friendship with God. This humble friendship with a good father who has good things for us. And then he will lift us up. How often do we try to lift our own selves up? How often times do we try to make things happen on our own? How often do we step outside of his will? I mean, if we just learn to submit to God, learn to resist the devil, that we're in a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle, learn to draw near to him, learn to cleanse our hands, we would be obedient, and then God would purify our hearts. As we go through this progression, it leads to a humble friendship with a father who loves us, whose love is perfect, and it's the best way. And then we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow's going to take care of itself. In due season, he will lift us up. We get to partner with him and seeing his kingdom established here on the earth. I want to see his kingdom established here on the earth. And it can't happen. It can't happen if we continue to try to make it on our own and try to do it on our own. We gotta trust him and his timing and in his way and then he lifts us up. Would you rise with me, I wanna pray for you.